Today, we're going to hear from a member of our 2023-24 fellowship cohort, Bree Lohman. Bree is a PhD candidate specializing in the history of technology, computing, and the environment in Cold War North America. She's based at the University of Toronto's Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology, and her dissertation explores the emergence, maintenance, and decline of the SAGE nuclear defense infrastructure in Canada and the United States. Bree holds master's degrees from Columbia University and the London School of Economics, both in the field of history. She has worked with various museums, including the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, the Computer History Museum, and Ingenium, Canada's Museums of Science and Innovation. In addition to the Linda Hall Library, she's received fellowships from the Jackman Humanities Institute, the Science History Institute, and the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation at the National Museum of American History. Her presentation today is entitled Bombs, Computers, and the Dawn of the Anthropocene. If you have any questions during the talk, you're welcome to paste them into the Q&A window or into the comments on Facebook. We'll keep an eye on both places. Uh, but for now, please join me in welcoming Brie Lohman. Uh, thank you so much, Ben, for the uh, lovely introduction. Uh, and thank you, too, for the opportunity uh, to deliver a public lecture at the Linda Hall Library. It really is a special place. Uh, I missed the days uh, last summer when I was working on my dissertation and looking at uh, looking out at the Arboretum. Um, and I very much miss it, and I hope everyone over there is doing well. So let's get started. So I trust you all can see my screen. Uh, let me just readjust. All right. So uh, today, what I'll be doing is discussing the historical entanglement of nuclear weapons and computer systems in the mid 20th century, an era that has been overlappingly periodized as uh, the Cold War, the Anthropocene, and the Information Age, just to name a few. Now, I'll argue that these two technologies, that of the bomb and the computer, did not develop uh, contemporaneously by accident. To the contrary, the pursuit of larger bomb yields directed the R&D of the computer industry via lucrative government contracts, which in turn precipitated an economic chain reaction, culminating in sustained explosive growth for the industry. This chain reaction channeled computers toward militaristic ends. It too left indelible pockmarks on the planet, with plutonium fallout marking the onset of the Anthropocene or the human epoch, though uh, we may imagine other origins for this era of human planetary domination. This talk begins with the Manhattan Project, the American-led undertaking to build the bomb. I then argue that one computer system, uh, which Ben mentioned, the SAGE Air Defense System, should be considered as the inheritor of this atomic legacy. A SAGE was developed to defend against a threat summoned into existence by the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that is, nuclear attack. I'll compare these two complexes of development by considering how they restructured the American economy and transformed perceptions of time consciousness and imagined futures. Now, in the last half of this talk, I'll discuss the emergence, operations, and limitations of the Sage Air de Fistum uh, by looking at one of its central innovations, the advent of real-time control, which utilized computational speed to map the live movements of aircraft to control nuclear risk. If you'll allow, real-time control may be considered a technology of the Anthropocene, for it sought to map the environment in gridded, sectored, fully know knowable spheres and it sought to predict future threats and thereby enclose them. Consequentially, it too served as a blueprint for the model of planetary surveillance existing today. So as an overview of the talk, uh, let's begin. In the countdown to zero time, the detonation of the first atomic bomb at the Trinity test site in New Mexico, Berlin Brixner readied the cameras, film loaded, films loaded, stops set, filters added, speed controls adjusted. His task, to capture a motion picture record of the explosion. To capture a detailed microsecond panorama of the blast, the cameras were arrayed in a perimeter around the test site, encased in bunkers with thick lead glass windows so they wouldn't be irradiated. Operating up to 10,000 frames per second, these cameras had been set up to document the micro permutations of the atomic blast presenting, as you see here, a visual frame-by-frame -frame 
archive of the event. At 5.29.45 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, the gadget, the codename for the experimental explosive device, detonated. As the historian Richard Rode shows in the Pulitzer Prize winning The Making of the Atomic Bomb, the research of which he conducted in part at the Linda Hall Library, the blinding flash of the blast irradiated brighter than daylight at the break of dawn. The blast burned holes through the first frames of the film before capturing what the novelist Cormac McCarthy described in his penultimate novel as a blooming evil lotus. The Trinity test, as attested by this stone marker on the site, marked the end of one kind of time and the apotheosis of another, writes Joseph Masco, creating an epical rupture between the before and after. Less than a, one month after a second sun rose in the deserts of New Mexico, two bombs codenamed Little Boy and Fat Man were, uh, Fat Man, were dropped on Hiroshima in Nagasaki on August 6th and 9th, 1945, claiming scores of lives. The true number of the dead is unknowable, but up to an estimated 120,000 were killed in Hiroshima and up to an estimated 80,000 killed in Nagasaki. The terrible power of the bombings literally marked the suspension of measured clock time in these sites, as watches recovered from the rubble were stopped at the time of the blast. The detonations over Alamogordo, New Mexico, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki summoned new imaginaries of time and new, new proximities to death. One of the earliest American publications on the nuclear age, One World or None, posed a question on the mind of many American readers. What would the Hiro Hiroshima bomb have done to New York City? A national magazine depicted an answer to this hypothetical question. And in One World or None, Philip Morrison imagined the detonation over New York in horrifyingly precise and descriptive detail. I quote from the river west to 7th Avenue and from south of Union Square, the streets were filled with the dead and dying. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists published the now iconic Doomsday Clock in 1947, marking the, midnight, uh, the minutes until midnight. Nuclear tests like Castle Bravo made a spectacle out of destruction, with Marshallese Islanders permanently displaced from radioactive islands, casualties of the dawning Pax Atomica, or Atomic Peace. In the coming years, an onslaught of nuclear tests would demonstrate the annihilating force of these attacks. And in one theatrical instance, simulating the impacts on American towns and on the American nuclear unit. A new institution, the Civil Defense Organization, normalized the horrors of nuclear war for the public with new sets of sanctioned behaviors, from hiding in backyard bunkers to participating in duck and cover uh, exercises at schools. The dropping of the bomb impelled Americans to look to a new nuclear future, but it also compelled scientists and engineers to explore the depths of microtime. From fissioning subatomic particles to swelling mushroom clouds, the atom defied access by the lenses of cameras that Berlin Brixner used in July 1945. To apprehend the nature of the atom, new methods of capture arose in an unexpected place, computing. These machines could plumb the deepening time gulfs between camera frames through calculation, modeling, and simulation. Indeed, the history of the bomb cannot be separated from the history of computing. As George Dyson Riley observed, the digital universe and the bomb were brought into existence at the same time. Early computers like ENIAC were utilized for nuclear weapons develop development as their accelerating performance and sheer mathematical brute force permitted the probabilistic modeling of subatomic particles with ever greater alacrity. Or, as the fictionalized John von Neumann says in Bruce Labatut's latest novel, I'm thinking about something much more important than bombs, my dear. I'm thinking about computers. Now, as Labatut continues, so those cursed things came alive within the digital circuits of a computer before exploding into our world. In this talk, I explore the entanglement of computers and bombs in the mid-20th century. 
To explore this co-emergent co-emergence at an axial moment in world history, I will turn to what is regarded as a pedestal computer in the pantheon of American computing. The Sage Air Defense System. A computer designed to safeguard the American Republic against nuclear attack, and specifically a certain type of nuclear attack. From 1945 to 1957, the con conventional delivery method of nuclear weapons was the bomber plane with the Enola Gay and Boxcar, which delivered bombs to Hiroshima and Nagasaki as the preeminent examples. So SAGE tracked bomber planes. And the most direct path between American cities and Soviet runways and vice versa was the Arctic Circle, which was imagined as the next theater of war. SAGE likewise looked north for atomic threats. Now, the use of computers for security marked a remarkably rapid shift in American defense policy which in the span of a decade came to rely on hyper-complex black box machinery to automate nuclear security surveillance. From the detonation of Trinity in 1945 to the onlining of the first SAGE system in 1958, which you see pictured, computers have become integral to two diametrically opposed projects, that of bomb building and that of national security. Now, SAGE stands for the semi-automatic ground environment, but that won't be on the test. A castle parapet of the Cold War, SAGE was designed to detect and intercept bomber planes with technologies you see here. Missiles, planes, radar stations, picket ships, the military industrial complex in a single diagram. SAGE uh, is pictured here. I'll say more about what it is presently. It was a permanent horizon watcher that threat mapped the United States and Canada, militarizing that atmosphere under the aegis of airspace security. SAGE was hemispheric, spanning from Southern California to modern day Nunavut in Canada and beyond. It comprised thousands of personnel, hundreds of installations, and endless stretches of infrastructure. You may not be familiar with SAGE, but we are all well acquainted with its effects. It served as a blueprint for many military systems, an exemplar for command and control architectures, a training ground for computer science and programming expertise, and it diffused technologies that would later be adopted everywhere from NASA to air traffic control. Famously, uh, the machine was one of the inspirations for the set of Dr. Strangelove as well. Now at the center of the SAGE air defense system was the direction center a forerunner of the modern data center as it's was it siloed data within a central repository. Now each direction center uh, was an above ground blockhouse of reinforced concrete stationed at US Air Force bases, with one exception in Canada, which was built underground. I can say more about that during the Q&A. Across the country, these centers accommodated up to 100 personnel attached to up to 100 stations. Together, they projected an around the clock picture of the air situation for the United States in real time, right? And we've been discussing temporality and I'll return to uh, the topic of real time shortly. The duplex SAGE computers weighed in at 275 tons and they were duplex, so there's two of them in the event that one stopped working. It covered 22,000 square feet and it could operate a billion machine steps in just a span of a few hours. And this all using not integrated circuits, but vacuum tubes. Now here's what you saw if you worked in one of the weapons rooms. The display pictured on the left, if it worked, projected the velocity, trajectory, and headwind of the selected aircraft as the symbols on the screen that you see in the left. So they would have something called a light gun. This was before uh the development of the mouse right and they would point the gun at the screen and it would register that information profoundly the sage air defense system serves as the manhattan project successor since it was constructed to defend against nuclear attack a threat summoned into existence by the bombings of hiroshima and nagasaki the danish physicist niels bohr had famously stated that the United States would need to transform into one huge factory to build just one atomic bomb. But between 1940 and 1996, according to a Brookings Institution report, the United States spent over $5.8 trillion to manufacture over 70,000 nuclear weapons, 
some of which were used uh, in the defense of the Republic with SAGE. The advent of the bomb produced new forms of risk, new forms of expertise, new forms of disaster, which all conjoined in the project of air defense. And this project confronted an intractable tension between, on the one hand, the American commitment to technological solutionism, or the usage of engineering know-how, and on the other hand, the fundamental indefensibility to the bomb. I've already cited this source, uh, published in 1946. Uh, the so-called father of American air defense, Louis Ridenor, wrote, uh, there could be no feasible defense against nuclear weapons. Yet Sage offered an alternative answer to that question, a question that I'll try to answer uh, near uh, the end of the talk. Now, as with the Manhattan Project, Sage reshaped the United States in pivotal and lasting ways. In a very fundamental sense, it brought the Cold War next door. The Cold War, writes the historian Tom Vanderbilt, was and is everywhere in America. In his study of Cold War architecture, Vanderbilt toured forgotten relics and ruins of the era. These symbols and artifacts of the Cold War, like Nixon's pyramid, were not merely material. They transformed how Americans thought about the prosecution of war and the responsibilities of citizenship. As the anthropologist Joseph Masco writes, this architecture provided officials, American officials, with a new means of engaging and disciplining citizens. Now, just as with uh, the Minuteman missile silos built in backyards uh, and in the country's breadbasket, Gretchen Hefner shows that the presence of this infrastructure helped Americans embrace the arms race as a legitimate means of waging war, as well as fostering a national dependence upon defense spending. Just as crucially, the Cold War did not only transform the social contract between state and citizen, it fundamentally restructured the economic base of the United States. Historians Campbell Craig and Frederick Lodgeval offer a reassessment of the Cold War, arguing today's dependency upon defense spending, which now reaches into almost every congressional district in the country and distorts electoral politics, originates from this era. Large military industries, ads for Rebecca Thorpe, located in rural and semi-rural areas that lack diverse economies, created powerful political incentives to press for ongoing military expenditure, regardless of actual or perceived national security threats, end quote. The Cold War, in other words, was good for business. It was good for Main Street. I have already alluded to, uh, as I've already alluded to, Sage bridges two periodizations of our present moment, the Cold War and the Anthropocene. Now, the Cold War, so goes conventional understandings or con conventional framings, which you see pictured here, uh, was an ideological battle between two fundamentally opposed systems, capitalism represented by the United States and communism represented by the Soviet Union, which lasted, depending on one's historical priorities, from World War II to the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, to paraphrase another scholar, Frederick Cooper, writing about another periodization, there are two problems with the Cold War, the cold part and the war part. Uh, appealing to the historian's penchant for complicating origins and challenging existing narratives, the Cold War has been provincialized, pluralized, and reframed into a kaleidoscope of interpretations. Or, as Odd Arn Westad puts it, the Cold War is not what it used to be. Unlike the Cold War, the Anthropocene is not a historical designation. It's a geological one. The meteorologist and atmospheric uh, chemist Paul Crutzen is credited with popularizing the term, uh, but he was referring not to nuclear radiation, but to the emissions of carbon dioxide, uh, a point that would be repeated by Anthropocene humanities scholars. Now, in 2009, the working group on the Anthropocene was organized and in 2016 agreed that the uh, epic formed a distinct strata in the Earth's crust, right? That is the archive of planetary history. 
In other words, the Anthropocene states that human impacts on the Earth have reached such an overwhelming scale that there will remain a permanent record of humanity's habitation on, uh, in the Earth's geology. With, as this paper showed, nuclear fallout, according to the working group, as a defining marker of the epoch. Now, I would be remiss if I did not mention that the placement of the Anthropocene's beginning with the nuclear arms race is a deeply controversial one. And many other industrial activities antedating Trinity show the enduring geological changes wrought by humanity on the Earth's surface. Nevertheless, I'm making an argumentative maneuver. And what is, interest, uh, what is of interest for this talk is that first, the Cold War and the Anthropocene, both as conventionally or dominantly understood, share points of origin with the Trinity test. The working group on the Anthropocene concluded that plutonium fallout, a rare earth metal virtually absent in the earth's crust, signifies the epoch of human domination, as demonstrated most forcefully and most convincingly by the thousands of nuclear tests conducted since 1945. The United States conducted, um, if I recall offhand, 1,154 tests, over 900 of which were in the continental United States, many of which were in uh, Nevada. Now, to illustrate this point, whereas Chernobyl, the worst accident in uh, human history, the worst nuclear accident in human history, released 45 million curies of iodine-31 into the atmosphere, global testing released at least 20 billion curies of radioactive iodine alone. Right? That is over 400 times the exposure of Chernobyl. Significantly, both periodizations also imagine the ends of the world, the harbingers of apocalypse, climate catastrophe on the one hand, and nuclear annihilation on the other. And so we return to the topic of time. Computers, those handmaidens of the bomb, also heralded new ways of thinking about temporality. However, there is nothing new uh, in this claim. Technologies have long influenced how societies perceive their worlds. Perhaps more than any other technology, the clock has changed how many societies view being in time. Scholars have documented how world industrialization in the 1800s reformed time consciousness as increasingly clock-based and as ever more divisible, profitable, and exploitable. For another example, as Wolfgang Schubelbush argued in a now seminal article, the railroad annihilated space-time as it ushered in a perceptual reduction of geography, enfolded localities within an ever closer relation to the metropole, remade national spaces, and constructed both new sensations and imaginaries of progress and modernity. In the classic Imagine Communities, Benedict Anderson illustrates how another technology of the newspaper contributed to the reformation of time as uh, unilinear and universal, an arrow always pointing in one direction. Likewise, E.P. Thompson's off-sided time work discipline in industrial capitalism compellingly argues that factory schedules disciplined the labor force to obey clock time over traditional understandings of calendrical time, inculcating a modern sense of being in time. The computer, like the railroad, the newspaper, the factory, and the clock, continued the historical trend of invoking new perceptions of temporality by opening new time horizons beyond the reach of human perception and cognition. The SAGE error defense system, importantly, was one of the earliest computer systems uh, that was largely known by the public and as such introduced swaths of the American public to thinking about everything from defense to control in computational terms to say nothing of surrendering, surrendering national security to a computer system. This brings us to the central innovation of SAGE and the subject of the remainder of this presentation, real-time control. In a 1957 conference talk at the Joint Computer Conferences, SAGE was heralded as the archetypal example of, as the conference put it, quote, computers with a deadline. 
In this widely cited article by Lincoln Laboratory staff, who I, I don't speak of very much here in this presentation, but I do consider as the engineers of the Cold War national security state, SAGE is described as a real-time control, communication, and management information system. So what does that mean? Uh, we'll unpack it. Now, it's important to note before we get there, though, that the relationship between SAGE and real-time is likewise paired in modern scholarship. Notably, the authors of these two excellent textbooks both privilege the history of real-time within their own chapters, beginning the lineage of real-time with SAGE. They too both cite the touchstone work, uh, Paul Edwards' A Closed World, which has rightly shaped discourse around SAGE since its publication in 1996. Edwards claimed that the air defense system uh, has served as, um, a metaphor and pointedly not a fact, a metaphor and not a fact of total defense and a closed world discourse. Uh, and this has stood the test of time and remains a compelling argument today. A sage enclosed the surveilled environment with a system of computer control. However, the question of what sage symbolized is separate from the question of how it operated, which is what interests me. Indeed, the record of SAGE has been a persistent and vexing problem within the history of computing. Scholars like Thomas Hughes acknowledge that it was a failure in terms of its stated mission, supplying air defense, which is quite a strong claim, while official historians assert that the question can't be answered of, you know, uh, of whether it achieved a stated mission because it was never tested. Now, after reviewing archives of the Air Force Historical Research Agency in Montgomery, Alabama, I'd like to venture an answer to that question of how and whether it worked by honing in on the operation of real time. So let's begin with a definition of what real time is. All definitions of the term share a common characteristic, regardless of whether we are citing Grace Hopper's programming glossary from 1953, housed at the Linda Hall Library, in fact, or Eric Raymond's New Hacker's Dictionary from the 1990s. And that shared characteristic between all these definitions is urgency. If a given problem is resolved within a pre-specified time frame, it is by definition real time. In SAGE terms, to give an example, this meant a Bomark uh, missile intercepting a Tupolev Soviet bomber plane before it reached ground zero. Thus the term, Real time rests on definitional uh, ambiguity as its articulation depends upon the context of the problem and the system in question. Under this wide umbrella, examples of real time computers may include everything from telephone switches and gun directors to thermometers and sundials as all quote unquote systems represented changes to the environment and something approaching yet never reaching total synchrony. With so broad a definition, we may locate the origins of real-time computing in the 19th century telegraphy, or the inner war period, or the late Bronze Age. However, we will focus on a particular lineage with SAGE. Now, as intuitive as the term real-time may seem, it's a non-obvious descriptor. It references temporal measures that are perceptible to humans, not computers. In fact, even the earliest analog computers operated beyond the pale of human comprehension. Rather, real time refers to the intervention of computers within environments on time scales that humans cannot access with reliability and regularity. Allow me to be more specific here, right? I'm talking about the tenth of a second, the hundredth of a second, the thousandth of a second, and beyond. By the late 1990s or late 1950s, uh, Developing out of electrical engineering, cybernetic, and management science discourses, the term real time gradually attached itself to the control of what I characterize as high information density and continually operating systems. Okay, so allow me to give some examples of what I mean by high information continually operating systems oil refineries, banking operations, health monitoring, and of course, air defense. Now, in addition, the investment uh, in real-time computing by the US government intensified a historical phenomenon discussed earlier of disciplining time ever more minutely. The speed of computers enabled unprecedented and precise manipulation of the real world by slicing time into ever smaller slivers 
of instrumental, uh, instrumentalizable use. However, all the term connotes instant action, there remained a time gap that real time could not bridge. Okay, a time gap between an external event, an event in the world, and its processing by a computer. A delay, in other words, which approaches, yet never reaches zero. In other words, there always remained a lag. So how did Sage come to be? Sage did not start out as a computer. Uh, it has a long and complicated, complicated history. I'm really only going to give you a very condensed version of that. Now, while Sage did not begin as a computer, it did begin as a real-time system. So in broad brushstrokes, in 1944, the Special Devices Division of the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics, so one of its R&D departments, and this is during World War II, approached the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to build a so-called universal flight simulator. Named Project Whirlwind, this theorized contraption would, if possible, simulate any aircraft's cockpit and thereby safely and cheaply train pilots needed for the air wars in the European and Pacific theaters. That the government approached MIT was significant. MIT was the nation's largest non-industrial defense contractor with 75 separate contracts worth nearly $120 million. Harvard, by contrast, garnered 30 million. In many ways, MIT um, is where the Cold War national security state was engineered in a very literal, as well as a very metaphorical sense. Uh, the man in charge of designing a universal flight simulator was Jay Forrester. He's typically the individual who's privileged in most historiographies. Really, it was a broad team of people. Uh, but again, uh, to tell the story, I'm making somewhat of an argumentative maneuver. Forrester was a graduate student in electrical engineering. He worked at MIT's Servo Mechanism Laboratory, so the antecedent to the Lincoln Laboratory. The speed, precision, and accuracy re required for this theoretical flight simulator to train pilots could not, in Forrester's view, be re uh, reproduced within an analog system. Now, during this time, many of his colleagues in and around MIT were exploring developments uh, of computing. And he was increasingly entranced by its possibilities. So there's the Pennsylvania School of Computing that was developed at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. John von Neumann was working on a computer system at the Institute of Advanced Study um, in Princeton. And so uh, along this corridor in the Northeast, uh, there was a milieu thinking about what computing could achieve. Now, eventually, uh, Forrester was drawn to, I quote, the promise of radical sim simplicity offered by digital computing, I'm quoting Paul Edwards. After the war ended, Forrester continued to work on the problem, uh, which was no longer so urgent. So the problem wasn't resolved during the war. Uh, he built up a large team and an even larger payroll. And Forrester, whom the Navy saw as brash and irresponsible, had a penchant for over-promising and under-delivering, a theme I'll return to later. By 1948, four years after the initial contract to build a universal flight simulator, two years after its shift to become a computer, Forrester had little to show. To the historian Sushi Akira, despite having spent over a million dollars, for all Forrester had to show for his efforts was a pile of memos, uh, reports, and still no working computer. Now, in 1948, as his funders at the Navy were tightening the financial reins, Forrester published what may be one of the most significant documents in the history of American computing, uh, a report that forecasts the future possible military developments of computer use um, for the next decade and a half. In effect, with this document, Forrester uh, proclaimed that he needed billions, not pittance, to transform the American battlefront. Now, in, one of, in the words of one of the few women in the Navy who oversaw the budget for Whirlwind, uh, Minor Rees, Forrester was not prescient. He was lucky. Uh, it was the detonation of a Soviet bomb in 1949, ending the brief era of American nuclear monopoly, that compelled the newly formed Air Force branch to step in and fund the project after some very adept maneuvering and marketing by people like George Valley. 
uh, but not as a flight simulator, but instead as an air defense system. Now, although Project Whirlwind, and again, that's the ancestor to SAGE, was uh, a highly classified undertaking, the fate of air defense uh, was litigated largely in the public sphere. I mean, there are a host of a governmental studies that were conducted, conducted from the transition from the Truman to the Eisenhower administration, all saying the same thing, arguing in favor of a nuclear defense system. But here we see again repeated the themes of overpromising and underdelivering. While Air Force officials were uh, initially supportive of such a project under Truman, officials under Eisenhower later critiqued the idea as a Maginot line, referring to the indefensible tre uh, French trench line. I tend to think this can, was also straw manned by uh, proponents of the Sage Air Defense System. Uh, there was a suite of opinions about this. Uh, Air Force, however, was more interested largely in uh, offensive power capability with SAC or Strategic Air Command. Um, so not with defense, but into delivering uh, weapons in the event of a war. Now, in support of air defense, even Robert Oppenheimer, the head of the Manhattan Project, weighed in, publishing his views in Foreign Affairs magazine. He called for a unified effort to secure our defense against the atom, I quote, uh, to counteract Soviet perfidy. In addition, uh, James Killian, uh, the president of MIT, uh, who had skin in the game, uh, overseeing the servo mechanism and later uh, the Lincoln Laboratory Affairs, joined the public discourse, writing a uh, op-ed in the Atlantic. And Killian stated, um, which is important to re for remembering, uh, let no one be under the misapprehension that a perfect air defense is technically or economically feasible. So perfect air defense was unachievable, he's arguing, and yet let it be equally clear that we are not helpless in greatly improving our defense. This was widely understood uh, among uh, the scientific and engineering communities that were exploring the problems of air defense. However, the syndicated columnists, uh, Joseph and Stuart Alsop, contravened uh, Killian's measured arguments, writing that the only impediment to, I quote, near total defense was Air Force, trans uh, Air Force intransigence. With the public battle won, stage was greenlit. So how did it fare? We're coming to uh, the last quarter of my talk. The New York sector was the first operational saved, uh, SAGE division, activating on July 1st, 1958. The rollout of SAGE was plagued with, in the assessment of one historian, growing pains. Air Force documents testify to the general confusion during the transition from manual uh, systems, which relied on human volunteers to survey the sky with binoculars, to automated computer systems. As the first installations in the SAGE era, the New York sector encountered many problems in all areas from programming to logistics. These problems encompass personnel shortages, unsustainable workloads, system integration failures, spare parts shortages. One of the most striking in looking at the archive that I learned about was staff encountered computer errors and the existing manuals did not possess the troubleshooting directions to resolve them. In addition, lower ranking officials uh, often attributed uh, the gamut of problems besetting SAGE to a general lack of direction from upper echelons. Now, while each of the 20 or 23 direction centers, by the way, have from a planned 46, uh, were designed on the architectural principle of uniformity, that is, they were all identical. However, each sector possessed unique topographies and sector would be just a, a division of United States airspace, irrespective of state lines, by the way. Air traffic patterns, state regulations, and defense equipment, which all demanded sector by sector programming. The expertise for this complicated individualized programming was still being developed. And so it was very much an operation flying by the seat of its pants. Thus, during the transition uh, from manual to automated defense, there were blank spots in the air coverage of SAGE. For example, the, perhaps the most interesting one is the subsector uh, radar station in the West Coast experienced coverage gaps, including one spanning from Merced to Bakersfield, California. So there, was, there were no eyes in the sky uh, 
in that part of California. There were notable failures outside of those listed here. As I cover in my dissertation, the collapse of an offshore SAGE radar station uh, off of the coast of New Jersey resulted in 28 entirely preventable deaths. Um, as I show in that chapter, the radar stations were derelict for months before it fell. In other words, it yielded no data for air defense, but it was staffed all the same. Now, during the operational spans of SAGE, there were many war games conducted to evaluate system effectiveness performed at direction centers like the one pictured here. Operation Sky Shield, for example, tested air defense capability. Strategic Air Command, playing the part of enemy aircraft, uh, breached North American airspace. The ca their countermeasures, electronic radar jamming, uh, inhibited radar uh, tracking, uh, while gap filler radars were rendered, rendered, I quote, totally ineffective. A later Sky Shield exercise, according to Air Force magazine, uh, successfully intercepted only around 30% of enemy sorties. So it was not the near total defense that the Alsop brothers imagined. These tests, however, allied a glaring shortcoming of SAGE, which is often mentioned in the first sentence of, of histories about it. It could track bomber planes, not intercontinental ballistic missiles. So it could track bomber planes, not ICBMs. The first Soviet missile was launched in 1957. SAGE came online in 1958. So how did SAGE personnel respond to these software and hardware problems? To work at a direction center, personnel had to, fill, had to pass a so-called human reliability program, begun in the mid-1960s, uh, which subjected candidates to rigorous psychological testing. Staff were disqualified from service for, among other reasons, given alcoholic tendencies, mental illness, and even marital strife. Personnel, like the computers they used, were subject to extensive, uh, if flawed, programming. Harold Sackman, employee for uh, System Development Corporation, the firm responsible for developing programming instruction to SAGE personnel, conducted studies across SAGE direction centers to evaluate personnel readiness. Interestingly, audits, uh, internal audits conducted by Sackman recorded visible aggra aggravations due to machine limitations. I find this to be very human humanizing to read in the archive. Now, when an operator made a computer request, uh, as you can see, it was quite complicated to do so. There were over 400 possible actions. There was no feedback to display that the request had been registered, according to uh, the information I have from Sackman. This caused operators to repeatedly press buttons, and this was troubling uh, during uh, times of high input loads, because as the refresh delay lengthened, it exacerbated the uncertainty of whether a request was registered. This could result not only in system unresponsiveness, which is an issue in its own right, but unreadable geographic displays, thereby interrupting the To draw on another set of evidence to this talk, and perhaps uh, we can have a discussion about some of this, what this means, because I'm still trying to figure it out. Now, during a fellowship I held at the Ingenium Museums in Ottawa, Ottawa, Ontario, I viewed these consoles, which we've already seen pictured. Um, so these machines were located in blue, blue lit rooms, which we've all also seen pictured, which ostensibly was done to heighten alertness. Now note that these consoles, as you can see uh, in the lower left of the right hand photo, uh, had built in ashtrays. And more often than not, they were stained with nicotine, which yielded a chemically induced alertness. Now in looking through these artifacts uh, at the Ingenium Museums, we uncovered graffiti on the consoles. It was actually located on this threaded uh, plastic screw, which had no ostensible purpose. Um, and what we found was a sort of uh, log of rank and file humor, aggravation, and resignation. Um, so I'll show some of the less choice ones that we found. Up yours, Twit. Help me get out. I was here. Uh, and then my favorite three, look up look down, Otis, wake up. So I end here by stepping back uh, and asking what can we conclude from this evidence I've shared? SAGE, as Paul Edwards Wright was, writes, was the model for 25 big L military systems. In profound ways, it served as a blueprint for this system of planetary surveillance operant today. And so it is indeed significant that a system that aspired to total enclosure was riddled with dead pixels, pixels, blank spots, and other perforations. 
And yet, as SAGE matured, operations smoothed and coverage expanded. So did it work? Well, it possessed the capacity to function and fail in parallel. Systems of this size could not escape localized failure, yet they could also endure it by yielding continuous, though fragmented, pictures of the so-called air situation. Nevertheless, uh, I argue that this evidence I have shared demonstrates that the SAGE era real-time projection of a closed world flickered, lagged, and slowed at critical junctures, rendering real-time unreal by its own definition. This technical capacity relied on simplifications of the real world, tracking only certain phenomena and mapping only relevant criteria, as you see pictured. It constructed a partial limited virtualization of the world, and yet the simplification was nevertheless too large and too unwieldy for SAGE to track in total, though that moment arguably would change. Now, as Louis Ridenor stated in 1946, there is no defense to nuclear weapons. After the investment of several billion dollars for SAGE, much the same remained true in 1963. The threat summoned into being by the Manhattan Project continues to haunt the present. I close with a quote from Black Rain, written by Hiroshima survivor Masuji Abuse. The one thing that still troubles me from that day of the attack is the ringing. It persists in my ear day and night like the tolling of a distant temple bell, warning man of the folly of the bomb. I thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much, Bree. That was a fascinating presentation. And I think that uh, you've raised a lot of uh, compelling issues about mm -hmm. the legacy of SAGE and the way that we think about uh, temporality even today, well beyond uh, you know the, the, the end of your story and, and the ostensible end of the Cold War. Um, the floor is open for people who want to ask questions. You are welcome to type them into the chat or into the Q&A box. Uh, at the bottom of your screen if you're watching on Zoom. If you're watching on Facebook, we are monitoring the comments on there as well. I will note that there are already several questions in the Q&A uh, window, so I will uh, pass along a few of them. Uh, Edward Quinlan asks, uh, I would love to hear more about the Underground Canadian Control Center you mentioned, please. Uh, and also, uh, how does the elimination of the Avro Arrow weigh into the ICBM and SAGE issue? Uh, in that case, he's thinking about it in terms of the shift in technology and how archaic tech and defense contracts were being outstripped by the development of novel technologies like ICBM and weapons delivery. Uh, thank you, Edward, for the question. Uh, let me start by answering the question. I'm actually from uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is the headquarters of NORAD today. Now, there was a northern headquarters of NORAD until uh, very, well, within the past 20 years. Uh, it was in North Bay, Ontario, which is several hours to the north of us, or to the north of me, excuse me. Um, there were 23 SAGE uh, direction centers uh, constructed. Uh, 22 of them were in the United States. The 23rd was in uh, Canada. It was the longest lived one. In fact, uh, when SAGE was finally closed and transitioned to another system, uh, that was in 1983. And that was in North Bay, Ontario. And the reason why it lasted so long is because it was, was using the terminology of the time. Uh, Freud would have a field day. It was hardened. It was built underground uh, under the Precambrian pre -Cambrian shield by um, 600 feet. And so just imagine uh, a nondescript office building built underground. And there wasn't any elevator. You took a bus uh, that, and you boarded the bus and you would drive in a narrow one lane road all the way down to the blast doors. Uh, and it provided quite the boon for uh, North Bay, Ontario, which is a, a small city, um, but it developed because of this investment from NORAD, um, the largest real estate boom in its history. And I can't speak to the Avro Aero. I think my colleagues at the Aviation Space Museum in Ottawa could say more, but there's one thing that I can note uh, part of the agreement for uh, Canada to scrap, uh, you know, this advanced um, craft was the agreement to adopt uh, nuclear, or well, to adopt uh, a set of different nuclear te or technologies, one of which was the Bomark missile. And at the end of 1963, uh, after the signing of, you know, uh, uh, non-proliferation treaties uh, with the Soviet Union, 
Under the dark, the cover of night before New Year's, the United States transported 28 uh, nuclear warheads uh, to North Bay, Ontario, where uh, they stood until 1972. So there were nuclear warheads and all told uh, over 50 of them in Canadian soil, one on North Bay, one in La Macaza. Uh, and the interesting fact that I'll end with is that, you know, opening and peering into the cabinet of Cold War curiosities, the you can visit the Bomark missile site. Again, this is a site that housed 28 nuclear warheads on Canadian soil for almost a decade. Uh, it is now a self-storage facility. So what once housed uh, missiles uh, now houses uh, summer speedboats and RVs. So the world's an interesting place. My goodness, that is a, a kind of a quirky twist of fate for that piece of uh, Cold War architecture. Um, still looking for questions here in the Q&A section. Uh, while we're waiting for folks to share their thoughts, uh, I have a quick question, which involves kind of broader uh, public reaction to the construction of SAGE. And particularly, I'm curious about whether or not uh, people in other countries were looking to the United States as a model, right, for their own nuclear defense systems. Uh, was there enough coverage, for example, that even folks in the Soviet Union would have been aware of what was going on? And did that shape any of their thinking on nuclear defense? Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, a very uh, good question, Ben. Um, I have to confess, I'm not equipped to give you uh, a full answer. Um, but one of the shortcomings of the Sage Air Defense System was that it was centralized. Uh, so Soviet air defense systems instead relied on decentralized systems. So if anyone's familiar with, uh, I think Paul Barron's like maps of like projected internets, right of uh, how information could be organized. Uh, some in the Air Force advocated for a decentralized system of uh, air defense because, uh, again, the Imagineers of war, whose task was to theorize, you know, possible future outcomes, uh, feared that uh, these sage air, uh, sage direction centers were easy targets. They were located uh, at priority sites. Uh, military uh, air force bases uh, and they were above ground right with the exception of uh, canada's um and the reason why they were built above ground was a, a price issue so the constraints of you know american defense de uh, spending changed quite significantly right from beginning with 46 direction centers to ending with 23 and as soon as they got to that number they were already um, retiring lots of them so in in some ways, it was almost a model of uh, how not uh, to build an air defense system. Uh, but with that said, I mean, the utility of this development project really radiated outward because all of these technologies, industries, areas of expertise were developed. There is also uh, at the Air Force Historical Research Agency, that's a repository for uh, Air Force history, still classified reports about the operation of SAGE during the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? And but and there the threat did not come, you know, from the Arctic, it came from, you know, Cuba. And I would love to read about uh, the effective operation of, of it, but that requires a freedom of information request. So again, thank you for that uh, very thoughtful question, Ben. I really appreciate it. And thank you for that thoughtful answer, Rudy. Uh, it looks like we have another question for you in the chat. David Yeski asks, did the safeguard system replace SAGE and was it shut down because of a treaty? My understanding, he writes, uh, was that safeguard was very effective. Um, when you say safeguard, David, well, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, I assume you mean uh, the ability of SAGE to intercept bomber planes. Um, and that's hard to assess. I, I, the evidence I provided in, of these war games that were conducted uh, demonstrates that it is very easily hampered. So a very simple counter countermeasures, such like deploying ch uh, chaff or chafe, um, could render these uh, radar systems um, it could interrupt them, meaning that the administration of air uh, air defense was stopped. So that's one thing to keep in mind. However, 
there, there's the other issue that the conventional delivery method for nuclear payloads change, right, from uh, this era of SAGE's development, right? It, it shifted from um, bomber planes to ICBMs, which moved too fast for SAGE to track. So there was a mat of overlaid infrastructures that were developed, right? So it wasn't just SAGE, it was, there was BMUs, which is another system, right? So they're layered on, on top of one another uh, in order to track what one system couldn't track, right? Um, so the, the opinion generally uh, of scholarship, uh, thinking of Paul Edwards and Thomas Hughes, is that um, it wasn't uh, that effective. And yet bomber planes moving through the air or aircraft surveillance had was a second order priority uh, for the United States and the Canadian governments. And so there are ways in which it did work well. And so my response response to questions that you ask, because I also ask the same questions, is to break the question into smaller pieces, right? How are the ways that it did and didn't work and why? Uh, oh, the safe program, you're, oh, excuse me. You're referring uh, to uh, something that postdates uh, my area of study. So my apologies, uh, David, but I hope I was able to answer part of your question well. So uh, David had a, a follow-up here that the Safeguard program was a huge pyramid that controlled 30 Spartan anti-ballistic missiles. Yeah, so that antedates my study. So I haven't looked at the archive for that. Um, but perhaps uh, you can study it and you can uh, tell us. Uh, I'd be, I would love to hear and we can continue the conversation uh, over email. That sounds great. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A window here. Uh, Emma Jablonski asks, uh, actually, Emma Jablonski begins by saying, thanks for the talk. Two questions. Uh, number one, did you come across anything in your research about the relationships between the networks of SAGE centers and the networks of supercomputers, like those at Lawrence Livermore or Los Alamos National Labs? Uh, and question number two, was there any relationship between SAGE and commercial air traffic control? All right. Emma, thanks for those two uh, very thoughtful questions. All right, let me just note them down so I don't forget. So I was recently uh, at Cornell University delivering a workshop in another one of my chapters. I met a graduate student there uh, who is working on supercomputing in India. And of course, uh, Roger Hart at the Linda Hall Library is working on uh, quantum computing uh, in China. Uh, so I would be interested to hear what they have to say. Um, so you're speaking uh, specifically to Lawrence Livermore uh, Laboratories. Um, the archives I viewed uh, doesn't seem to indicate uh, any uh, direct interaction, but certainly I, I imagine there was cross-pollination. Uh, the, the Lincoln Laboratory had a revolving door of experts coming in and out, right? And one of the things that Jay Forrester and Bob Everett and others argued was that their method of building a computer system uh, was unique. It, it constituted a different school of thought, a school of thought you uh, separate from that being conducted at the University of Pennsylvania and the Institute of Advanced Study. Um, and interestingly, I think there are like very subtle yet distinct differences uh, that arise at these centers uh, of computing. Uh, I happen to think in the scholarship that cybernetics is overdetermined, right? I, I think the work of applied electrical engineering that's being conducted at the Servo Mechanism Laboratory and later uh, the Lincoln Laboratory is subtly distinct from what's being conducted in other areas. And I think that would also be true of uh, what's uh, being done at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. In addition, I also have a recommendation of, uh, for a reading. Uh, I cited it. It's uh, Bruce uh, Labatut's uh, The Maniac, uh, which looks at the development of one of, it's a triptych structure, and what the middle chapter or section looks at the uh, development of the Maniac computer in Los Alamos. Perhaps it'd be of interest. Marvelous. Oh, and air traffic control. I didn't answer that question. Uh, very briefly, so we can get to some more questions. Yes. Right, uh, IBM worked on Sage, and then they spun out uh, their work on Sage for a civilian operation, which was Saber. Uh, and Paul Saruzzi writes about that uh, wonderfully uh, and uh, his uh, history of modern computing. 
Excellent. We have a couple of more questions left. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, but I think that we can probably answer at least these two. Uh, first off, we have an anonymous question from Facebook. Uh, sorry if you talked about this already and I missed it, but have scientists found geological evidence from nuclear tests that is evidence of being in a new epoch, the Anthropocene? Uh, yes. Um, so th this is so-called the golden spike. But again, um, there's another work I'm, I'm thinking of, I, I, and it's uh, a billion black Anthropocenes or none, right? And the author there argues that, you know, there were many uh, world endings that occurred before 1945. And so it is somewhat controversial to you know, start the Anthropocene in 1945. We can imagine alternative origins, for example, um, uh, the industrial or slash industrious revolutions. Um, but yes, ge geologists uh, convened in 2016, and they had a vote on what is the defining marker of the Anthropocene. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, uh, there were, there was a lot of degree, disagreement about which would mark uh, the onset of this era. And winning this vote by narrow margin was plutonium fallout, but carbon emissions were also considered uh, the proliferation of plastics. Uh, yeah, so the evidence that human habitation has transformed the earth is incontrovertible, right? It's, the question arises, is where uh, do we start it? And historians and geologists might disagree there. Fair enough. Thank you so much. And our final question comes from Nathan Rutzen. Uh, were there human to human data transfers inside of SAGE when going from the incoming data to the final output? Okay. I am. Nathan, can I ask you to perhaps elaborate the question? Um, would this, uh, I could potentially foresee this question as, all right, was all of the data transfer automated? Thank you. Um, well, it's a difficult question to answer. So, the Sage Direction Centers were just like these were machines that proliferated different forms of data uh, that was uh, output also on paper. Uh, and so there were large teams of men and women who worked on this, right, on taking this information and displaying it, and sometimes drawing uh, the live air situation uh, on a board at a combat center. So, you know, the generals could uh, deliberate over uh, the air situation. So it wasn't all automated, and there were many different forms of data transfer that existed at these sites. Um, that is a very uh, incisive question. Uh, so uh, thank you, Nathan. All right, and thank you again, Bree, for a wonderful presentation. Thanks to all of you who tuned in to join us today. I hope that you enjoyed this discussion of uh, a fascinating, albeit a little bit grim topic. Um, we hope that we'll see you again soon at another Linda Hall Library program in the not too distant future. If you visit lindahall.org, you can find out more information about Bree's research and about the other work that our fellows have been doing, as well as updates about our upcoming events. You can even join our, our mailing list to get regular updates. Uh, until next time, we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much and goodbye for now. <laughs>